Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and Aviation Outlook. I'm Alan Stolzer, Dean of the College of Aviation in Daytona Beach. Aviation Outlook is a live webinar that features key aviation and aerospace leaders discussing the current state of aviation and what the future holds for the people and businesses in this most dynamic industry. These webinars are free and open to all, and we bring you a new program every two to three weeks. To find out more about our next webinar, just Google Embry-Riddle Aviation Outlook. We have several great ones just ahead you won't want to miss. On our website, you can watch videos and recaps of previous guests, including Airbus America's CEO, Jeff Niddle, Embry-Riddle President, Dr. P. Barry Butler, FAA Administrator Steve Dixon, NTSB Chairman Robert Sumwalt, and many others. To introduce our outstanding guest for tonight, Ben Baldanza, and to moderate tonight's webinar, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Daniel Friedenzone, Associate Dean and Professor in the College of Aviation. Daniel. Thanks, Dean Stolzer. It is our pleasure to welcome Ben Baldanza to Aviation Outlook. Ben is an engaging and very successful business leader who has worked for commercial airlines for over three decades, including 11 years as the innovative and at times controversial CEO of Spirit Airlines. From 2005 to 2016 at Spirit, Ben is credited with taking a small startup airline and creating a new sector of airline travel in North America, the ultra low cost carrier. Spirit became an economic powerhouse that had provided travel opportunities for millions of people throughout the Western Hemisphere. Prior to Spirit, Ben also brought innovation and changes to US Airways, Continental Airlines, and Dhaka Airlines. He began his career at Northwest and American Airlines. Today, Baldanza is owner and CEO of Dymocker LLC, a business advisory firm that is named after a famous strategy board game, and that's an interesting story we will ask him about. He serves on the boards of JetBlue Airways and Six Flags Entertainment. He is also an adjunct professor of economics at George Mason University and is the co-host with NPR Seth Kaplan of Airlines Confidential, a very popular weekly podcast. Ben is a fellow Syracuse University graduate with a bachelor's in policy studies and economics and he earned a master of public affairs degree at Princeton University and somewhere lurking in his past is a young man with a trombone in his hands. Ben Baldanza, welcome to Aviation Outlook. Well, thank you, Daniel, for that very nice introduction. I'm very happy to be here with you on this webinar. Before we look back at your remarkable career, I'd like to get your thoughts on the state of the airline industry today. Uh, we've heard that large carriers like American United and others uh, have announced uh, layoffs and furloughing of lots of employees as the CARES Act payroll support program for the industry expires in about a month. Um, other carriers have reached agreements with their uh, certain employee groups, such as Spirit Airlines yesterday with their pilots to avoid furloughs, very positive development. I'm interested in hearing how will things evolve going forward? Well, that's the, the billion dollar question, Daniel. You know, this is an industry that has been marked by massive change over the last number of decades in terms of the competitors, in terms of technology, in terms of external events like the financial crisis and the attacks at 9-11 and such. But this COVID disease has given the industry a challenge that it has not yet seen, a dramatic precipitous drop in demand um, with an uncertainty as to when people are going to just be comfortable getting on an airplane again. And that uncertainty leads to a lot of things that airlines have to think about now, like, do we need to be smaller and how long will we need to be smaller? Can we stay liquid through this time when we're not generating a lot of cash because we're not carrying a lot of people? How can we continue to pay the, pay the debt on our airplanes, continue to pay employees and such? So every airline is thinking about what this means for their fleet, for the size of their company, whether short haul travel might return faster than long haul travel. So what might it mean for my narrow body fleet versus my wide body fleet? There's all kinds of uh, issues that airlines are thinking about right now. And the, while we can't be certain about what the future will be, 
we can be certain about one thing, which is that the airlines that make smarter and more proactive decisions around how they treat their customers, how they're talking to their employees, how they think about their fleet and how they think about their positioning, those airlines are gonna emerge from this relatively stronger than those who squander this environment to say, now we need to think about how do we change. What's your sense in terms of, is additional government uh, action needed to deal with this kind of in the short term? Um, I know you mentioned the airlines themselves have to make some good decisions, important decisions going forward, but what's your sense with respect to uh, government additional aid to the airlines or to their employees? Well, the government supports airlines in a lot of ways, obviously. They run air traffic control. Every, most, almost every airport in the United States is run by some government, you know, whether it's a local or in the case of DCA and Dulles here in Washington, the federal government. Um, so in terms of aid to sort of keep the airlines alive right now, what the first CARES Act did was three things. It provided $25 billion in grants that were basically passed throughs to employees and kept employment up. Then there were $25, million, $25 billion, excuse me, in loan opportunities that some carriers applied for and not all did, but it was just another opportunity for liquidity. Airlines also tapped private markets and are continuing to tap private markets using innovative collateral even like slots and gates or frequent flyer programs as collateral. And then there was a part of the first CARES Act, there was a, a temporary um, stoppage of collecting the seven and a half percent ticket excise tax. So most of, most of the listeners to this webinar might realize that when you buy an airline ticket, seven and a half percent of that price gets paid to the government in an excise tax. And in the short term, airlines are not having to pay that tax, so it lets them keep a little bit more of the cash. That has helped the industry keep employment up through the summer. That all ends in September, at the end of September. For there to be an extension, there are good and bad arguments against that. The, the arguments against it are largely, well, the industry is not going to recover for a long time, so why are we forestalling any changes airlines need to make? I would argue that it's good policy and good economics for the government to support another CARES Act for employees. And the reason is, Daniel, we have some encouraging news around the virus in terms of the plasma that was just announced. There's talks of vaccines being tested. There was an interesting story in the New York Times a week ago where Scientists are rethinking what the threshold for herd immunity might be. All of those things suggest to me that it's possible, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not predicting this, right? But it's possible that by early or mid next year, we might have a better understanding about how to live with this virus. And if that's the case, I think it would be good policy to have airlines be ready to go again, have all the pilots current on their flights, have all the mechanics current, have everybody there ready to get all those planes back in the air because airlines represent a fundamental infrastructure part of this economy. And we're not gonna have a return to a strong economy without a return of the airline industry. So keeping that car in the garage idling, as opposed to on bon blocks, I think is a good thing in the short term. And it, we might find that the recovery takes a lot longer and maybe we shouldn't have keep, kept paying all those people. But where we are right now, I think it's a good idea policy wise. You know, you've been in the industry a long time, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I'm also struck that your experience and kind of, it seemed, what shaped your view of the industry really started uh, when you were growing up and you had a newspaper route. It, it impacted how you uh, viewed a business and really, to some extent, network planning. Can you share a little bit about that? Well, absolutely. And thank you for asking about that. Yeah, I grew up in a small city in upstate New York that uh, had an evening newspaper, but the town uh, down the road had a morning newspaper. And so the morning newspaper was subscribed to by not a lot of people in the city that I lived in, uh, but that's the paper I delivered because I went to school and I, so I would deliver the paper before school. And so I realized that 
on every block that I delivered to, I was delivering to just one or two houses, but I was passing every house on my bike with this stack of newspapers. So I got the idea early on, I would buy an extra five or 10 papers from the company every week, and I would pick a block and I would deliver to every house on the block. And I'd put a little note and say, my name's Ben, I deliver papers, I ride by your house every morning, it would be real easy for me to drop off this paper for you if you wanna subscribe. And in that process, I more than quadrupled the size of my route in a short period of time. And I never thought about it in terms of marginal cost or utilization or terms like that. I learned much later on, but that's exactly what it was. I realized it didn't cost me a lot more to, to deliver that extra paper because I was there anyway. I realized that I could better, that my time was better used when I could deliver to all 10 houses on the block, not just two of them. And so these fundamental ideas of of business that drive network businesses and businesses were really uh, fomented in my mind very early on, even though I didn't realize that was going on. I was just excited to make some money. Really interesting. I wanna to speak to something that it was also seemed to be important in your life, at least your professional work life, and that was an internship that you had at American Airlines. Um, can you tell a little bit about that, that experience? You know, we're here in, on a college campus. Many of our students have internships, but how did that internship experience affect you? That internship was very influential in my career, Daniel. At the time, if you go back to the 1980s, for those who can do that in their mind, <laughs> um, you know, the industry had been deregulated in late 1978. And American Airlines, led by Bob Crandall as the CEO at that time, was a very innovative airline at that time. And they recruited heavily at MBA schools. They, they would go out every year and recruit at, you know, schools like Embry-Riddle and Harvard and Duke and, and, and um, Wharton and places like that. And most of those people went to go work in the finance department. And that's because Bob Crandall was a finance guy and he didn't want decisions made about his company without the finance people running the numbers. So on fleet, on labor, on routes, all of that went through the finance department. Now, I went to a public policy school. The school I went to wouldn't be a normal school that American recruited at. But as an intern, they were a little more open-minded. So I had an interview on the phone with one of their people and talked to them about why I was interested. I had done an internship at Amtrak while I was at Princeton. And I talked about that and why I thought planes were more fun than trains. I had recently got my private pilot's license as well. So they took a, they took a risk in a sense saying, you know, wait, you can come down to Dallas for three months and we'll see if this works. And I had a terrific internship. I worked in the finance department at American. I met some great people. I got to work on real interesting projects. I got to fly around on the airline a bit. And by the time I left in August, I said, this is where I want to come to work. And fortunately, they said, and we want you to come back here. So I went back, completed my second year of my MPA program. Um, but American offered me a full-time job and, and I was excited to go back to work there. It was a very dynamic environment there at the time. A lot of smart people, a lot of innovation. As you know, many of the things that are really common in the industry, things like frequent fire programs and hub and spoke networks and computerized reservations and yield management, all these things were really in their infancy in the 1980s. When you ended up working there, uh you were part of a group that one journalist called the Brat Pack. Several of you ended up uh, becoming CEOs of carriers, including current American Airlines CEO, Doug Parker, and uh, former CEO, Tom Horton. Um, what was that like? What was your experience working at American at the time? As you mentioned, it, it seemed like it was one of the, the, the dream jobs that anybody could have, certainly if they wanted to work in the industry, but really any, the dream job if you wanted to work in business. Well, I, you know, I think that's right. I think it was a real innovative time in the industry. And because American wanted smart people in their company, um, and then somehow they hired me, but they wanted smart people in their company and they expected people to work hard. We worked hard, we challenged each other, um, but people were excited about trying to help the company, about helping to make good decisions, and just being in an environment where everybody's working hard, everybody's rowing the boat in the same direction, you know, everybody is, is trying to 
effectively solve the same kind of problems, maybe from a different dimension, financial planning versus financial analysis, maybe versus pricing revenue management, things like that. Um, but it was a great environment. I met, I met a lot of people, still have a lot of friends from that environment. I'm very proud to have worked there. I'm very proud to have seen the enormous success that many people who were part of American at that time have gone on to do. You also had an opportunity to work at several other carriers after Northwest, uh, Continental, U.S. Airways, uh, Taka. Um, what did you learn and uh, from those experiences? Well, that would that would be uh, that would be multiple webinars, I think, to try to answer that completely. Uh, sure. But I learned a lot. Obviously, different carriers who have different positions in the competitive space, different cost structures different strengths and weaknesses all present little di different challenges. You know, at, um, at American, I was mostly a finance guy and spent a little time in revenue management. At Northwest, I sort of did some finance and revenue management. By the time I went to Continental, I was thinking much more about the, the pricing, revenue management, aircraft scheduling kind of world and working under a, you know, a dynamic leader like Gordon Bethune was able to do a uh, you know, a really good job there, I think. And then when I got the opportunity to go to Taka, that was my first opportunity to really manage a P&L and to have to think about operations as well as just finance or just marketing. And I realized at Taka that a smaller company like Taka was at the time um, could be a really fun place to work. I had only worked at bigger companies at that point, but I had a bigger role at Taka. I had to think about the customers, the airplanes, the operations, the delays, as well as the right prices and the right schedule and things. And that really opened my mind. So when I went to US Airways, they were uh, very good to me and offered me a role that included some marketing and some operations. And I think had I not done all those things, I don't think I would have even accepted the job at Spirit, let alone been able to bring a team with me that created the success that that team created at Spirit. As you were advancing in your career, did you have mentors that played a role in guiding you, giving you advice, people you could talk to about different opportunities or maybe just issues you were having at work and maybe get some guidance on how to solve them? Absolutely, yes. I, there is no doubt that, that my career was, has been largely shaped by, by mentorship kind of experiences I've had with a number of people, starting at American Airlines, the people I worked with there, like Gerard Arpey, like Doug Parker, were people that I trusted and, and could talk to very well. Um, at, at Continental, um, Gordon Bethune and Greg Brenneman were very dynamic, positive leaders. I learned a lot just from watching them work. Larry Kellner, who came in as the CFO and then was the CEO at United for a while. At US Airways, working with people like Rakesh Gangwal and Steve Wolf taught me another whole different way to think and different set of priorities. At Taka, there was no one more dynamic I've ever met in the world than Federico Block, a real ball of energy and a guy who sort of loved life but loved business and would work 24 hours a day and just trying to keep up with Federico was a message in itself. And then at Spirit, I, I was absolutely became a better CEO because I, because I was mentored directly by Bill Frankie, who's a real smart guy and understood a lot of the pressures I would have as CEO and helped me a lot in that area. Let's turn to Spirit since you brought it up. When you uh, joined the company and eventually became CEO, you made the decision, um, I believe that Spirit was gonna basically compete for customers on the basis of price and price alone. Um, <laughs> somewhat bold, can you share a little bit about that strategy? Well, yeah, that's a great question. That's exactly right. So if you go back to 2005 or so, when, we, when I first joined Spirit, we were a small company. We had 32 airplanes, um, MD-80 airplanes that were at that point slowly transitioning to the A320 family. And we had uh, not particularly great real estate. We had a nice position at the Fort Lauderdale Airport in the International Terminal. Um, but we didn't have a lot of, you know, access in places like New York or Chicago or LA or where a lot of people live, right? <laughs> and so, um, so we made the decision that we, we had this epiphany that the whole industry is out there fighting for business travelers. 
and everybody is trying to argue my product is better so you should fly me or I fly to more locations so you should fly to meet with me or my freak up fire program I'll let you take better vacations so you should fly with me or I'm part of this worldwide alliance so you should fly with me and we looked at data and we looked at what people wanted, really wanted out of their airlines. And we saw overwhelmingly the thing that people mostly wanted out of their airlines was a cheap price. And they wanted a cheap price even more than, than a frequent flyer program or a business class or things like that. So we said, we looked at Ryanair and what they were doing in Europe. And we said, what if we just changed our view? And what if we said, we're going to be the airline for people who pay for tickets themselves? Because if they pay for the ticket out of their own pocket, they're going to care more about the price of the ticket. And maybe they're willing to accept some compromises around seat comfort or time of the flight or things like that. And once we made that decision, it was amazingly mind opening in terms of how it let us make a lot of other decisions quite easily. We had the A319 airplane with 135 seats on that plane but the FAA let you put 145 seats on it, right? So we said, let's put 10 more seats on that plane. We can make the price lower for everyone if we do that. And the ancillary revenue process started when we said, look, not everyone checks bags. Why make everybody pay for all the bag infrastructure? So let's charge people who don't check bags less money and let's charge the people who check the bags for checking the bag. And that, that idea just propelled us. And because we weren't out chasing business customers, we didn't have to worry about the schedule being perfectly timed. We could run a schedule for high utilization. So the plane would take off, it would land, 35 minutes later, it would take off and go somewhere else. And we would try to use all 24 hours of the clock, of course, keeping the maintenance requirements that we needed for the airplane. But that allowed us to push our utilization up, get more flights out of every gate, um, and keep the price as low as possible. When I got to Spirit, our average fare was about $105 and we collected $5 after the ticket, mostly for drinks on board and maybe overweight baggage. By the time I left, our average fare was in the $60 range, even though fuel price had gone up a lot in that time, but our ancillary collections were north of $50. So we completely changed the dynamic. Not everybody liked it, the media didn't like it, but the customers who wanna save money all really liked it and Spirit's been very successful with that strategy. And again, I'm very proud that they identified a market position, that we were able to get a team together that believed that, that had strong conviction on that and could really make that happen. Some would argue, I know the press reports, I remember watching the news when Spirit announced some of its ancillary initiatives. Um, you know, there was some outrage in certain parts. It certainly gave, uh, got the carrier attention, maybe not the attention you necessarily wanted at the time, but quite frankly, you were really the first of what eventually became somewhat an industry, industry standard in terms of offering ancillary opportunities to customers buying tickets on for flights, right? I think that's right. We estimated at one point that while we were only carrying just north of 1% of the traffic in the United States, that's how small we were actually, Don, that when that was happening, we estimated that we our name showed up in about 25% of every story about airlines. Right? And we realized that we really defined one end of the airline industry. You know, you had Delta and American United fighting for that global big end. You had Southwest doing what it was doing, but we were such a pariah in a sense in the way we were doing things that we really defined one end. So I'm not saying that every time we were mentioned, it was, it was, complimentary, but our name was there. And uh, at one industry event, one of uh, Delta's leader at the time ex had expressed to Bill Frankie, who was our chairman, it's like, we spend all this money advertising and as many people know your airline is mine. <laughs> and we thought that was pretty great, actually. Sure. In addition to focusing on keeping fares low in any given market that Spirit flew from, you also focused on the cost side. You mentioned some, some of the initiatives you know, having low unit costs uh, by adding seats on the airplanes and things of that nature. Was that difficult to communicate to uh, the employees at the company to really understand kind of what the business model and why it was the right choice for the airline? Well, changing the culture of the airline was one of the major things that had to happen for that airline to be successful. 
So we talk to people about our position in the industry, where our strengths could be, how we could be unique as a carrier that could really offer the lowest fare to customers. We had lots of testimonials from customers um, talking about how now they could fly thanks to Spirit. One particularly great thing I remember, Daniel, was in 2011 or 2012, the, um, um, the program Nightline um, came down to watch our operation and they wanted to interview people as they came off the plane, say like, why did you fly Spirit? And I think they were expecting to hear, oh, I'll never do it again, this was terrible. And what they heard was a lot of people saying, well, the place it was cheap, it was the cheapest way I could get here. And after hearing enough of that, they got a little bit frustrated. And as we were walking out of the airport, there was an older grandmotherly looking kind of person waiting at the gate for a flight to Atlanta. And they said, well, let's talk to her. And they said, are you flying Spirit back to Atlanta? And she said, yes, I am. And they said, why did you buy a ticket on Spirit? And she said, my daughter lives in St. Thomas and I was down visiting my daughter and I'm on the way home now. And they said, well, doesn't Delta fly nonstop to St. Thomas from Atlanta? And she looked at them like they were from Mars. And she said, oh my, that trip would cost over $700. I can fly on Spirit for under $200 round trip. I want to see my grandkids more often. And, and, and that was sort of, I could have kissed that woman. It was so perfect. We couldn't have scripted better. And at that point, the news crew sort of said, we get it now. <laughs> You also led by example in your headquarters. My understanding is you brought your own vacuum cleaner into your office. Uh, you and others were responsible for, you know, uh, taking out, cleaning out your garbage, emptying the garbage cans and vacuuming your own offices. You didn't have for at least a while, a receptionist in the front door. You had to use a phone to call the person you were supposed to meet with at headquarters. Was that kind of important to your sending, you know, sharing the message uh, with your colleagues at the company? It was very important and it helps it helped set the tone. We also didn't pay um, janit a janitorial service to take out trash. We paid them to clean the rugs and things like that. But every like, and it gave us the opportunity, me, my CFO, my chief commercial officer, all the leaders in the company, it gave the opportunity every once in a while to just pick up their trash can, walk through the building, say hi to everyone and go dump their trash. And it sets a tone of, hey, They'll do it. I can do it too. We had um, we had fluorescent lighting in the building that had three bulbs in them. We took out a bulb in each one of them, and it was still really light. And then we had a bunch of extra bulbs, and you know we didn't replace bulbs as often. And none of those things you it would be hard to measure those things on the chasm line, right? You'd have to go out to a lot of digits to measure that. But in terms of the influence, in terms of people understanding how important even little costs are it made a huge difference in transforming the culture. And it got to the point where people were excited when they found ways to save money. And they said, you know, we can do this cheaper and they would get excited about that. And we can charge our customers even less money if we do this. And that became a real game within the airline. And that was real positive for the culture of the company. By all accounts, when you were the CEO, the company uh, Spirit was extremely successful, very profitable. It was growing sometimes at very high growth rates. Um, what surprised you the most during your tenure there that you maybe you didn't know kind of going in? Well, a couple things did. Um, one thing that surprised me was how sticky the ancillary revenue is. You know, when we first started ancillary revenue as a strategy, and by ancillary revenue, of course, I mean charges for things other than the ticket. Um, when we first started that, we really, as we modeled it financially, we thought if we got a dollar more in bag fees and others, we would take a dollar off the ticket price, right? And it would be a straight trade, but customers could save money by customizing their ticket a little better. You've got that uh, Liberty Mutual Insurance Company now that talks about we customize your insurance, you know, only pay for what you need. And I'm saying like, that's what we were doing at Spirit, right? We didn't have an emu though. <laughs> but the, um, but what we found is that we, as we added ancillary revenue, if I can speak like an economist for a minute, the price elasticity of those ancillary products were different than the ticket. So while somebody may say, I'm going to fly airline A versus B, for a difference in price of $10, once they're going there, whether the bag is 20 or $25 didn't make that much of a difference, whether the customer checked the bag. And we realized that 
the, the, the robustness of the ancillary revenue was much greater. So instead of trading a dollar of ancillary revenue for a dollar in ticket, we could trade a dollar in ancillary revenue for something less than a dollar off in the ticket. We'd still, we'd still lower the price, but not the same amount. That surprised us a lot. The other thing that surprised us, I think, was just how negative the travel media thought about some of the things we did. When we announced the carry-on bag fee, um, we, it, 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 was, it, was, it was like, uh, it was like we had done something terrible to the planet. It was amazing how negative the media was. I mean, the first media after we announced that was 100% negative. No one said, well, maybe this will clear up all the gate delays because of baggage. And maybe flight attendants won't get as injured putting up big bags. Like nobody said anything like that. It was all, how can you charge for that? Isn't it when you're born, aren't, isn't one of your rights to like, free speech and a free bag when you fly, right? <laughs> that was the way it was approached. And I was just surprised how strong the, the, the media reaction to some of our things were. But if anything, that, that grew our conviction even further and said, we have to explain why this makes sense. And I'm really proud that you know, 20 years after that decision, that the airline's still doing that and other air, some other airlines are doing that too, because it makes sense. Yeah, sure. When you were at Spirit also, your company, you mentioned earlier, migrated to the uh, A320 family of aircraft. I think a lot of our, our uh, people that are hearing this webinar would be interested in learning a little bit about the process that a company goes through in evaluating aircraft, uh, not only for the short term, but quite frankly, for the long term, and also the engine process in terms of selecting an engine. Can you share a little bit about that process? Absolutely. Fleet planning is such an important issue at any airline. And if I, can, if I can talk for a minute, Daniel, about that process, most decisions an airline makes don't have no more than maybe a few months or maybe a year impact. You can change a schedule, but if something doesn't work, you can pull a plane out and do something else with it. You can make a pricing initiative, but maybe that only affects the, nine, the next 90 days or so. Fleet planning is the one thing an airline does where they have to think about years and even decades in advance. You start paying for airplanes years before you get them. They're very expensive to buy and to operate. And so you're making a bet on what you think energy prices are gonna be, macro economy is gonna be, competitive positioning. So it's a real, real important thing that airlines do. And generally the top minds in the company are involved in thinking about that. When I joined Spirit, one of the reasons I was excited to go there is that the private equity group called Oak Tree Capital, who had initially bought Spirit, um, they had already placed an order for the Airbus A320 family airplanes. And their view was Spirit's flying older airplanes, the MD-80, not very fuel efficient. If we bring new airplanes here, we can save on the maintenance cost, we can save on the fuel burn, and if we can figure out how to make a strategy out of this, maybe we can make this work. And when I was at Taka, Taka was going through a transition from the early 737s, 737, 200, and 300 models to the A320 family. So I had gone through that operational change at Taka, and I felt confident that I knew what it would take at Spirit when Oak Tree asked me about being their president to come down there. And I will say that the transition to the Airbus airplanes for Spirit more because they were new airplanes, not necessarily only because they were Airbus. I don't want to. I don't want to make anyone at Airbus mad at me, right? But um, but it probably could have worked with 737 800s also, like Ryanair does, right? Um, but the point is that transition became really, really important to the company because, as many of, as you and I'm sure many of your listeners will remember, um, in that period from 2006 to 2009, oil prices were highly volatile. And those MD-80s would have been hemorrhaging cash while the, the newer airplanes were much more efficient. It allowed Spirit to be more efficient. Now, at the same time, though, there was a roughly 18-month period from 2005 to 2007 where about 20% of our pilot wages were paid to pilots who never flew a rev one revenue hour because they were learning to fly the new airplane. We had to train everybody on that new airplane. Everybody had to be type rated on that airplane. 
Some of the pilots adapted really quickly because they had flown planes like that. Others took a little longer because the Airbus is an all fly by wire plane, for example, and the MDA is a stick and rudder airplane. And so um, just, the, just the, the cost that it takes to transition that fleet, having two fleets flying, having two sets of mechanics or mechanics who can fix both airplanes, parts for both. Once we converted completely to the Airbus airplane, the last MD-80 flew for Spirit in the fall of, in the fall of 2016. So 2017 was the first year that Spirit was an all Airbus airline. And 2017 was also the first year that Spirit Airlines started to make money. And I think those things are related. What are your thoughts? Some carriers have been operating narrow body aircraft uh, for kind of smaller markets, transatlantic, um, you know, United and before that Continental operated their 757s across the Atlantic. Airbus with their A321LR and perhaps even the XLR uh, has a very interesting product out there. Uh, some carriers like Aer Lingus have already operating it on transatlantic routes. What do you think about the future of that airplane and will that really change the landscape for perhaps less wide body airplanes operating transatlantic routes and more narrow body uh, airplanes that have the range and can carry the full capacity? Well, I think the newer model long range airplanes made by both Airbus and Boeing are changing that dynamic a lot. You know, a wide body airplane or dual aisle airplane as some like to call it, um, are, are very expensive to buy and very expensive to fly. And the challenge with that, I, I talk about this to, with my students at my George Mason class. I, I, I sort of say, look, you can make this much money with a narrow body and you can lose this money, much money. And with a wide body, you can make a little more money, but you can lose a lot more money, right? And so it, it's just a much bigger, different risk profile with the wide body. Now you need the wide body airplane for range for longer haul routes. You know, Emirates couldn't have its hub in Dubai and do what it does with the XLR, right? Or, uh, or a 787. But the 787s, the XLR, the seven, the seven, um, uh, um, the A350, those airplanes are changing how many wide bodies need to be flying. They're allowing secondary routes that otherwise would have to connect to a hub to be flown nonstop in an economic way. And they're absolutely a game changer in the same way that if you go back decades, the original uh, 767 was a game changer against the 747s that were flying across the ocean. I want to get your thoughts on some of the industry dynamics, uh, even government policy that's occurred over the last you know, several decades. One of the issues is, um, you know, we've had a deregulated marketplace now for almost essentially 40 years. Um, how has that worked in your opinion? You've worked in the industry for much of that time. Uh, you've seen the good parts of deregulation and maybe the not so good parts, but what are your thoughts on it in terms of government policy and whether it was the right thing for this country? Well, while there are some who might disagree with me on this, I think the deregulation of the airline industry for price and schedule, again, the industry is still heavily regulated around sure. safety and training and maintenance as it should be, but the, the deregulation for price and schedule, I think was an amazing policy success for this country. And in context, it wasn't a unique event either. If you look at the 10, 15 years before the airline industry was deregulated, there were deregulation efforts in trucking and railroads and other things. So the country was thinking about these are businesses that maybe don't need as much heavy handed regulation around what they do for consumers. The choice that people have today, I mean, even people who hated spirit, and would, would call me and say, I'm never going to fly your airline. And I would say to them, I understand that, but please recognize that you have better choices because we exist. A world where there's Spirit and JetBlue and Delta is a world that's better than a world of all JetBlue, all Delta, or all Spirit. Right? We have choices in where we eat. We have choices in the cars we drive. We have choices in the clothes we wear. We have choices in all the kinds of things we do, and we should for our airlines also. And deregulation made that happen. Yes, it created failures. Yes, it created volatile earnings for a long time. 
yes, it messed up a lot of people who worked in the industry and then had their pensions stripped in bankruptcy. And I'm not going to say that everything about deregulation was, was a success. But in terms of democratizing travel and making travel not only for the 1% of the United States and making it so anyone could travel, I think deregulation was a huge success. And just the fact that we have expectations that we should be able to fly anywhere we want at a cheap price anytime we want, I don't think people would even have that expectation without deregulation. The industry went through some uh, significant structural changes between 2000 and 2010 uh, with significant mergers, four large mergers in this country. That impacted obviously not only those companies, but also probably affected your uh, company. What are your thoughts on that in terms of, you know, the industry has been until earlier this year, really had been very profitable, was really riding on a high. What are your thoughts on some of those changes that occurred during that time period? Well, those changes really set up um, a number of years of strong profitability for the airline industry. Really from sort of 2012 until COVID hit, the industry had by far its most profitable period since deregulation. And consolidation really made that happen. Let me give you a good example of why, a really specific example. When I worked at Northwest Airlines, we had a hub in Detroit, a hub in Minneapolis, and a hub in Memphis. That hub in Memphis had come from an earlier consolidation when Northwest merged with Republic, for those who may remember that, right? But within Northwest Network, Memphis was really unique, right? It carried flows and it carried revenues that Northwest would not likely carry through its northern hubs in Detroit and Minneapolis. You know, from Jacksonville to LA, people aren't going to go to Minneapolis when they've got Atlanta and Dallas there, right, to connect through. And so when Northwest would think about Memphis, it could lose something less than 100% of its cost because it had long-term debt at the airport. And, and if they got rid of all the people at Memphis because of the seniority contracts, the most junior people would leave the airline. So their average labor cost would go up and such. And so they wouldn't lose all the cost, but they would lose close to 100% of the revenue. So on a marginal basis, Memphis was accretive to Northwest and they couldn't close it. Now Delta buys Northwest and all of a sudden you've got this enormous Atlanta hub just to the east of Memphis. And now, even though you don't save 100% of the costs at Memphis, you keep close to 100% of the revenue. So now you can close Memphis as a hub. And while that's not great for the people in Memphis, that happened in Memphis, in Pittsburgh, in Cincinnati, in a number of places. And the closure of what I call those marginal hubs, and I call them marginal because they were dependent on connection traffic rather than a large local traffic base. One of the reasons Atlanta is so wonderful for Delta or Dallas for American or Chicago for American and United is because, yes, they connect a lot of people, but a lot of people go to those cities too and they have that local traffic base. And when you think about pricing in the industry, the transcon price and the price to get from A to B was really influenced from those marginal hubs. If you wanted to fly from Raleigh to Phoenix, maybe there wasn't even a nonstop flight, but everyone had empty seats from Raleigh to their hub and from their hub to Phoenix. So Raleigh to Phoenix was real cheap. And what happened is that consolidation brought pricing up, not great for consumers, but it brought pricing up to a level that for the first time since deregulation made the prices in the industry commensurate and, and, and supportive of the cost structure in the industry. So I don't think the industry would have had the success that it had in the years prior to COVID without that consolidation. And it was a massive efficiency play for the industry. Network, bigger networks are more efficient. Every airline got bigger. So the four huge airlines today in the US, American United, Delta and Southwest, that each prior to COVID were carrying about 20% of the traffic, were all better off because of the consolidations that they went through. Since you left the industry, uh, you're, you, you're wearing different hats now. Some of them are very interesting. I'd like to ask you a few questions about it. So you sit on the board of directors of JetBlue Airways, and Six Flags. What is that like in terms of not running the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, company, but really kind of thinking about the long term and thinking, dealing with those type of issues? Well, I think it's I think it's terrific. 
you know, um, when, when I left Spirit, in part it was because my time there was done and it was ready for a new leader who Bob Fanaro became and now Ted Christie is, and I think that's great for the company. Um, but also we had a son who we wanted to raise in a little different environment. And uh, I felt I was ready to do something else. Being able to get the opportunity to be on the board of JetBlue, to be on the board of a non-airline company like Six Flags that has capital cost issues and consumer issues and utilization issues and all, a lot of things similar to an airline actually, has actually been great because it keeps my mind really engaged. It allows me to keep working with great people. It allows me to use my experience to sort of help where I can as these companies think through problem. And I get to learn from a whole new set of people. You talked about mentors early on. I feel like I've had that going on even more now. So I really like the role that I can play now and uh, that I can help companies at a higher level where I can help direct, think about strategy, help, help individuals in those companies think about their business problem, but don't necessarily have to think the way I had to think as a CEO. When I think about the set of problems, business problems that I have to think about every day and that I have to think about reacting to every day, it's just a much richer mix of problems today than when I was a CEO, because it's fun to be a CEO, sure. but you can't, not, you can't avoid things when you're a CEO. You gotta think of everything and it's not all fun. What I do now is mostly fun. <laughs> You've also become uh, a popular writer. Your articles appear on Forbes.com. Uh, I recommend everybody uh, take a look. And also you have a very successful podcast, Airlines Confidential. What has that been like from kind of making the news to analyzing it? <laughs> you know, it, it's fun. And I think it's, uh, I still sort of, uh, I still sort of am surprised every once in a while that people want to listen to what I say or read what I write. But they, but they do in some sense, and I think that's great. I like the fact that you know when I was at when I was at Spirit, I I got better over time at going on TV and explaining the company's business model, and even when attacked on TV, could sort of hold my own as to around why we were doing what we were doing. The combination of that experience, plus teaching the college class that I'm teaching. In both cases, I've had to sort of refine my messaging and get better about the way I talk about problems and find ways to explain things that people can understand, even if they don't have a rich history in the airlines. And I found that that's helped me as I, as I write some of the things. In the Forbes case, they called me and asked me if I would write for them because they had read some things I had written on LinkedIn and others. And I was, I was, I was really impressed by that. I thought, how great that they thought something I had done was good enough that they would want me to write for them. So I feel an obligation to, to really work hard for them and write good things and not only just to analyze airlines, but think about the travel space and get people thinking and maybe take a controversial stance now and then if, if, that, if that makes sense. But so I really like the fact that I can, uh, that I can still have some influence in the industry through my writing, through my board roles, through the podcast, and that, that's really fun. And if I have a point that I want to make, I, I have sort of platforms to promote that point. And if I have, uh, and I can still get pushback from listeners on the podcast, from people sure. who react to the Forbes, you know, from maybe another board member who says, well, we don't think that is the right thing for us to do. And that's great. That keeps your mind sharp and that keeps you uh, always thinking. Sure. What's your advice? You're spending time now teaching an adjunct, uh, as an adjunct instructor at the university level. What's your advice to current students uh, that want to enter the industry, want to work in the industry, uh, some of whom may uh, occupy the CEO office one day or maybe the captain on an A320? Well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, what I like to tell students is don't confuse great company with great job. They're not necessarily the same thing. You know, investors know that there's a difference between good companies and good stocks, right? <laughs> that uh, the stock that has the most appreciation might be a better stock than the stock of a company that's a really great company, but is already fairly valued. And what I say is there's a difference between good companies and good, and good jobs in that just because you like the company and like the product they do doesn't necessarily mean that company is going to have the best job opportunity for you to showcase what you can do and the kind of influence you can have. Maybe if you go to a company that 
isn't the best in its space, or maybe is, uh, is even in an industry that you think initially might not be as interesting to you as something, you might find that at that company, your ability to influence the results, to have good mentors, to have great experience working on substantial kind of projects might be even better. So what I encourage my students at George Mason and when I go back and talk to my alma mater's classes as well, as well I say be really open-minded about where you go to work. They're, you know, Apple and Google and Amazon are great companies, but they don't have a monopoly on the best jobs in the company. I'm sure there's great jobs at all those companies, but there's great jobs at big airlines. There's great jobs at little airlines. There's great jobs at Lessors. There's great jobs at MROs, right? There's great jobs in a lot of places in the aviation world. So find what you're passionate about. Maybe take a risk, which sounds risky to you, but might not be that risky to try an industry or a, or a sector of the industry that maybe you're not as comfortable with, but maybe you can really shine. One of the things I tell students is what is the likelihood that you go work for Amazon and that in two years, Jeff Bezos is going to point to you and say, Yo, you're the person I want to lead this massive new effort for us. It could happen, but it's not that likely. But you go to some other companies, the likelihood of that maybe is a little bit higher. You're a big fan of board games. I think at one point you had a collection of 4,000 board games. Um, but you've also used board games as a way to, uh, and you recommend that they can help uh, prepare people for the airline industry. What is the connection between having fun and playing a board game and working in the airline industry and dealing with complex problems? Well, that's a, that's, thank you for asking that question. You know, the kind of board games I like are, are games that are made for adults that are strategy-based games. And generally, whether you win or lose the game is a function of how well you played that game and how well you use the resources available to you and the maybe limited set of actions you had to position yourself to, by knowing how to win to actually make that happen. And what I found is that that keeps my brain fresh and it's smarter. When I was growing up, I'll, this is, goes back to the paper route days in a way. When I was growing up, I, I was part of a family that we used to like to play card games. And often after dinner, we'd clear the table and we'd play card games for a little time. So to me, the idea of playing games as, a, as an avocation, as opposed to maybe watching TV or watching a movie, right, was, was just a natural thing. What I like about game playing is that you play the game and you play the other people in the game. You're, you're having competition, but it's friendly competition. You can talk, you can, you can, uh, you can have a real engaging kind of an, uh, environment in an hour or an hour and a half really good game. And I find that it's, I find it a better use of keeping my mind sharp, a better use of having to think uh, proactively about how do I use limited resource to be successful? And that's what business is all about. How can I be successful using more limited resources? So um, a couple of years ago, a, a writer came to my house in Florida and we played a board game and there was a story written about that. And through the game, he was interviewing me about the airline and we used the game as sort of a metaphor for the whole business. And I thought that was really a really interesting idea and it was well done. But I like to play games. I like to play with my wife and son. And when COVID's over, we'll invite some more people over to play too. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I look forward to receiving an invitation at some point. Oh, you're welcome anytime, Daniel. <laughs> Let me ask you one final question. This has been really interesting. Uh, You've experienced a lot of ups and downs in the industry. Uh, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on whether the current situation presents an opportunity for airlines to transform their business models and what might that look like? Fantastic question and you're absolutely right. Every negative environment and every external shock has changed this industry and COVID will do the same thing. I mentioned earlier that airlines are making smarter decisions right now around their liquidity, their fleet, their customers, their employees, things like that, will likely emerge from this a little stronger, maybe relative competitively. So I think, there, I think it's likely for some consolidation to follow when COVID's over. Maybe some carriers who thought of themselves as buyers are maybe sellers now and vice versa. So I think some consolidation is possible. I think people rethinking the role of wide body and narrow bodies may change for the long term. I think people understanding 
what consumer sentiment is about what kind of flying is risky and what kind of flying is still okay. What's the role of Zoom and Microsoft Teams and things like that in business? I think all of those things are going to force airlines to think about what's their relationship with customers, what's their what business are they really in now, how is that changing, and how can we position ourselves to change ourselves to be most effective in that environment? The airlines thinking like that right now are the airlines who are going to be the winners in the next decade. Ben, thank you for joining us tonight. It was really wonderful to hear your perspective on the industry, uh, to hear your thoughts on what the future will look like. I'd like to invite all of you to our next Aviation Outlook webinar on September 9th at 6 p.m. Eastern, Eastern Time. We'll hear from two Embry-Riddle graduates, Elise Atkins and Michael D., uh, who are currently air, airline captains. Captain Atkins is currently an assistant chief pilot and an air crew program designee on the Boeing 757 and 767 at UPS. Captain Michael D is the Managing Director of Flight Operations for Republic Airways. Thanks once again to Ben Baldanza and the Aviation Outlook production team. Have a great night and thanks for joining us.